For the Wild podcast is brought to you by our sponsor, the Calliopeia Foundation. Calliopeia believes in supporting individuals and organizations that work to transform our ecological, cultural, and spiritual relationships with each other and our common home. We thank Calliopeia for their ongoing support of creative projects that we believe in. To learn more, visit calliopeia.org. Before we begin, I'd like to flag for our listeners back home that this episode contains heavy content, including sexual assault and trauma, colonial violence, and human trafficking. Welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. We have to keep fighting for our future generations. We have to keep fighting for visibility. We have to keep fighting for equality. All I can say to people is like, get involved. And it doesn't have to necessarily be with what I'm supporting or what Roxanne is supporting or, you know, what everybody else is supporting, but get involved in something. Watch over me. Today we are speaking with Rachel Heaton and Roxanne White. Rachel is a member of the Muckleshoot Tribe of Auburn, Washington, a mother of three children, a fitness trainer, a lover of nature and an activist. She traveled to Standing Rock several times to stand alongside water and land protectors and helped form a coalition that successfully persuaded the city of Seattle to divest their $3 billion from Wells Fargo one of the leading funders of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Through her work, Rachel co-founded Mazaska Talks, an indigenous-led organization that offers tools to help others divest their personal finances, cities, and organizations from Wall Street banks, funding the desecration of Mother Earth. Rachel believes in using Mazaska Talks and other advocacy platforms to bring greater visibility to indigenous people and shed light on issues like missing and murdered indigenous women, men, and children, as well as ongoing rights and treaty violations. Roxanne is a fearless and dedicated grassroots organizer and social justice advocate in Indian country. She is Yakima and Nez Perce, and a lifelong resident of the Yakima Indian Reservation. Recognized nationally for her work on native issues, Roxanne serves as the Indigenous Outreach Coordinator for Innovations Human Trafficking Collaborative in Olympia, Washington. Inspired by the tragic loss of her auntie, she works to amplify the voices of missing and murdered Indigenous women across North America, providing advocacy and support for families with missing and murdered relatives. As a survivor of human trafficking, domestic violence, childhood abduction, and sexual abuse, Roxanne draws on her personal experience to empower and support other trauma survivors. She embodies vibrant indigenous leadership through the resilience of culture and ceremony, and has been featured in HuffPost, the Canadian Broadcast Channel, CNN, and other local and national media outlets. So I want to just start off by taking some time to thank both of you this morning. I feel incredibly humbled to have the opportunity to be in conversation with two such incredibly powerful leaders in the indigenous rights and environmental movements. And I just want to say that over the past few years, you have joined forces with coalitions from 350.org Seattle, Rainforest Action Network, Honor the Earth, Indigenous Environmental Network, Greenpeace USA, and other indigenous leaders, activists, and allies in a campaign to force J.P. Morgan Chase to stop funding climate disaster and the build-out of devastating new fossil fuel projects. And I think many of us just don't know that oil, gas, and coal companies are wholly dependent on major bank loans to construct new multi-billion dollar projects and pipelines like the Dakota Access or Keystone XL, which would cost TransCanada $8 billion. So, Rachel... Perhaps you can ground our listeners in the historical arc of this campaign from the perspective of Mazaska Talks and how you come to be involved in this movement and how Mazaska Talks is leveraging economic power through divestment beyond Chase Bank to stop the flow of tar sands pipelines. Gosh, 
there's a really long answer and then there's a really short answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, it didn't start with the intentions of us going after these banks or anything. What it started with was just a bunch of us, a, a number of Native people finally having the ability to use social media as a way to bring issues to light um, to the general public versus just our own communities. So that started with Standing Rock. But it started with just going over there and wanting personally to just be involved in something and being involved with, you know, our, our, you know, our native people. And there's so much lateral oppression that goes on in our communities that um, I think for myself, I was just screaming, wanting to just part of something that didn't have to do with my blood quantum and it didn't have to do with what tribe I was enrolled in. And so for me, I went over because I just wanted to help. And, and the reason, you know, and, and all of that work um, with what was going on at Standing Rock, you know, it was the attention was be, finally brought once we came back to Seattle, I would connected with Matt Rimley and he had actually had found out that Wells Fargo was one of the largest funders of the Dakota Access Pipeline. And so I think a lot of us were just trying to find ways to help and to be a part of what was going on over there, even when we couldn't be over there. And so after, you know, having a conversation with Matt and Hugh McMillan and, and the number of activities that were going on over here, um, we were able to start targeting. We found out that the C city of Seattle um, were actually banking with Wells Fargo. And so with that information that Matt had, it gave us the opportunity to kind of join those issues together. And, and from that point, then we found out that there were 63 banks that are actually funding fossil fuel projects all over the world uh, at the time. And so I think we it, it kind of gave us some leverage, not that divestment is anything new, but it gave us the opportunity to use that tool for everyday people. Like we could make decisions and say, you know, take your money out of this bank or um, don't bank with this bank because they fossil, you know, they fund fossil fuel projects and all of the horrible atrocities and things that come with the funding of those projects, you know, the desecration of sacred lands, you know, the violation of indigenous rights, but also the number of things that these banks have done to just marginalized groups. And so um, that kind of began the, camp the campaign for targeting those specific banks and, and for being able to join these fights and to bring it to a platform of issues and things that were already going on. But so after, you know, we came here and, and we had teamed up with 350 Seattle and kind of developed this coalition that would attack, you know, Seattle to remove their money from these banks. Um, that's kind of how, I guess, in a summarized way, a lot of this, this work picked up. And so, of course, you know, fast forwarding to 2017, uh, February, not long before the camps had completely closed down, we were able to get the city of Seattle to divest their $3 billion from Wells Fargo. And from that, we developed a tool, which was Mazda Scott Talks, that would then give other cities, other universities, uh, basically anybody um, a toolkit that could divest their own communities and, and, and things from these Wall Street banks that are investing in these projects. But from an indigenous perspective that we, you know, we were able to still lead it in that way. So that's kind of what Mazda Scott Talks was really started with what it means is um, there's no traditional words for money. We didn't have money. And so it's it means Lakota for shiny metal, which would have been like silver, or gold. And so Mazda Scott Talks means money talks. And since that point, I think over $40 billion has been removed from these banks because, you know, of this, this work of, you know, putting it into everyday people's hands, but then also being able to address the issues such that you'll hear more about with talking with Roxanne about missing and murdered indigenous women, children, men, but also the man camps that are a result of, you know, these fossil fuel projects and all of the human trafficking and things that take place simply because of this funding. And so it's not just about the fossil fuels, it's also about the issues that are happening in our indigenous communities and to our people as a result of these 
projects taken place and being funded. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, thank you for that, Rachel. I think that was a perfect introduction that really helped ground this conversation. And now, Roxanne, your organization and presence has also brought such a critical voice to the heart of this resistance, reminding us that the desecration of our earth is intimately connected to the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, or MMIWG. And the statistics on this issue are just so horrifying. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, nearly half of all Native American women have been raped, beaten, or stalked by an intimate partner. One in three will be raped in their lifetime. And on some reservations, women are murdered at a rate 10 times higher than that of the national average. So I'm wondering, how is the rising crisis of MMIWG connected to the construction of pipelines and other fossil fuel projects? And how is your organization Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives No Borders, addressing and raising awareness around these important intersections. So thank you, Rachel. That was an excellent introduction, and it definitely uh, says a whole lot. I appreciate your work, sis. And um, I guess what comes to my heart is that I learn like every day more and more from when I first started this journey from Standing Rock. So it's forever like changing. I'm learning new things. Um, I'm seeing like the really wide, wide picture. I'm getting inside, you know, with the families. I work a lot with families. So, but historically what we know is that um, the first man camps were at the first point of contact when um, Columbus first landed on our territories, on our homeland. So he, they brought the first man camps They brought the first brothels here. And, you know, when you talk about like how does missing and murdered indigenous women connect with uh, fossil fuel industry, um, since first point of contact, the genocide and the rape of our mother earth, of our, of our sacred waters, our, our women, um, our children, our men, these things are all connected. Our, our, our wildlife, you know, um, the whole, the whole spectrum. So indigenous people of this continent have been devastated by this first point of contact and we are still seeing it. You know, a lot of people don't really understand like, well, what do you mean genocide? You know, people have this idea that, you know, Native American people, uh, get big per capita. Um, we have big casinos, big money, and they don't really, I mean, that's just what the government, I guess, that's the story they want to spin. But the reality is, is that the lands that our ancestors fought for, you know, by signing treaties that trying to save and trying to protect what little they could for the rest of us, for the future generations, for, for the love of Mother Earth, for the love of their great, great grandchildren and those great, great grandchildren. When you think about that, you think about how the territories that we still have they have yet and still come after, as you've seen in Dakota, Dakota pipeline. You, we, we all seen that, like how, and it still happens like that. So the, you know, it's not just like we were given these lands and, and these treaties have been respected. No, um, the government is steadily finding ways to break those treaties and to continue to commit not just genocide on, on us and our women, but also on our Mother Earth which affects our entire families, our, our entire communities. And these man camps, they're very dangerous. I will say that, that a lot of people envision, you know, man camps being thousand count modules, trailer type modules, you know, and we've seen those. We've learned that those are set up for the Keystone XL and Dakota Access. We've seen those modules, but there's so many different styles of man camps. So where there's waters like Alaskan waterways, they have man camps with the ships, with the cargo, the exports. In, in agriculture areas where tribes have a lot of agriculture, they bring in another form of man camp there. So we're being, we're being um, targeted and, and um, exploited in this manner uh, by men, okay? Men that are not connected to us, don't respect us, don't know our families, don't value us as a people. A lot of these men are 
men that kind of don't have anything else. They're not, you know, maybe they've, they've burned bridges in their life and they had nothing to lose. So why don't I just go make all this money? A lot of them have drug, drug issues themselves. They've had a criminal history. These are who these pipelines uh, are, these um, pipelines are hiring. So they go into our communities, they get these big checks. They bring forth a lot of drugs, a lot of sexual violence, trafficking. It's, it's horrific when you, when you, when you really think about it and, and targeting, like, like being around Native American communities, uh, where we already are experiencing the battles of oppression and systemic racism and genocide already. And we're, I'm not saying that we're just these pitiful people, but we have, we have, uh, internal things that we're trying to still heal from from that first point of contact and from the ongoing genocide from the United States government. Mm -hmm. How I'm helping with that, I believe, and I'm not alone, I believe that there's so many, I think a lot of people are doing their part. The legislators are, are starting to do their part. Uh, the government uh, will see what they do. We have uh, governors, indigenous women like Deb Holland, Ruth Buffalo. I really hope to see uh, Paulette Jordan run again in Idaho State to wake up. And we have a lot of things on the ground, great things happening, and we're all doing it grassroots, grassroots organizations that lead for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and people all across Indian country play a huge part in, in advocating and fighting for justice for the families and for the missing women. Uh, because we all know we don't have a system set up yet. There's no actual like data where we can really specify like what that looks like as far as human trafficking, what that, where that stems from. I mean, we're, we're in the process of that, but hands up to the First Nations uh, sisters and relatives that um, just came out with their final report from their inquiry. They had a recommendation of 231 um, inserts of, of key point issues that they wanted to identify that need systems that need to be worked into programs, um, identifying where there was problems. I think it's an excellent final report. I've learned a lot from our First Nations who've been on the front lines for missing and murdered Indigenous women uh, for more than a decade. I haven't been on this journey that long, but I have. I was born into this life of, of being an Indigenous woman. I experienced a lot of trauma as a child. I'll tell you this. I, I was missing at the age of four. I won't go into a lot of detail because, you know, it's really graphic what happened to me at the age of four. By the age of 22, after like foster homes and and um, being abused, uh, even as a woman in my first relationship with my children's father, which I barely survived that situation. But yet again, I'm coming through these situations and at the age of 22, I was trafficked. And I was trafficked at a man camp. And the man camp wasn't an oil Bakken man camp, it was a farm worker man camp. So, but we as indigenous, People have been dealing with the government setting up and using and raping our lands and uh, poisoning our waters for a very long time. And it's a direct link. Uh, us as Indigenous women and, and our people and our families have been affected by all this in a really negative way. And um, hopefully, eventually, we'll be able to pull together some numbers that, that definitely show that. Wow, Roxanne, thank you so much for that. And thank you for sharing some of the more intimate personal details with us. It's, I think, extremely important for those of us listening to really sit with the intensity and complexity of this situation. And I'd actually like to read a quote from your most recent action in April, or I guess maybe this is um, an, an action. I don't know if both of you were involved in it, but I think local activists protested and disrupted 44 Chase Bank branches in Seattle and uh, with similar direct actions in 22 other cities across the country. And Rachel, you said, quote, we're here because we want a better future for our little ones. We're here for a better future for ourselves. We're not here to cause a problem. We're here to raise awareness. We're here to be nonviolent. We're also here to let you know we are still here, end quote. And what your words bring up for me is that these are matters of reproductive justice. 
Sovereign Bodies Institute has estimated that there are more than 5,000 indigenous children who have had their mothers stolen by violence. So the right to regenerate and raise children weaves throughout all of this work, mirroring the fragile web of life that is breaking down as many species face an uphill battle to reproduce. So I'm wondering how does this ethic Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm and I'm really wondering how this ethic of reproductive justice and regeneration enter your work and inform how you carry the torch for the next generation and why must mothers, women, gender nonconforming and two-spirit people be centered and honored in this movement. You know, before I say anything, I just want to, you know, thank Roxanne. Like I constantly look up to her and the work that she does. And so every time I get the opportunity to, to hear her speak and to hear the work that she supports and does, like it truly does, like it touches me in ways that I don't have ways for. So I'm just thankful for you, Roxanne, and for everything that you do. Mm. You know, Thank you, for, for me, linking our children into this work is so, it, it's so important because for one, it starts with the history of the systems that have been set up. You know, when we look at, you know, the matriarchs being removed out of our communities, when we look at, you know, the patriarchy system and the way that it's set up anyway, you know, we, we've been removed from our children and from our families and put into the system that doesn't allow us to grow and to heal and to be nurtured. And so, you know, I I think being a mom, you know, uh, again, to a baby, not just my older children, it's also changed my perspective in the sense of like, wow, 40 years from now, like, it's going to be such a different world for him if we don't get involved. And it doesn't mean just, you know, talk about it. We actually have to show them what they're fighting for. Because as we see, we can we can tell people a million times, do this, do this, do this. And it doesn't always mean that people are going to get an action. But if you bring someone up in it and you expose them to it and you, you know, um, nurture them in that way, you know, I want it to be just a, an automatic torch that gets passed on. But bigger than that, our people are still here and and we have to sustain that. When we look at the laws that are being passed for on women's rights and we look at the decisions that are being made and forced sterilization that still takes place. And more than ever, I think having our children visible and in this work is so important because if we don't, they're literally going to get left behind because we're so hidden behind our screens and our electronics. And so for me, it's become personal, you know, because I can't, I'm I'm not going to be able to fight for our people forever. Roxanne's not going to be able to, but we have to know that we've done the work to show our future kid, you know, our kids that are here right now and the ones that are coming that, you know, we have to keep doing this and we have to keep being visible and we have to keep putting ourselves out there and we have to keep being uncomfortable because we've been invisible for so long that it's just that these are the ways that we're having to get these messages out there. And so I think, you know, our children being involved in it is the absolute way that we have to go. For me personally, I'm not telling everybody to bring their children on the front lines and fights, but that's where it sits for me and where it sits in my heart. And, you know, and I'm not fighting just for my kids. I'm fighting for all of our children. You know, when Roxanne's spreading the message that she is, she's doing this work for all of those future generations so that we can start undoing you know, these traumas and hopefully it it being a past thing. I'm a grandmother now, but in my 16th year. Play with friends on the prairie. If progress would allow, we live forever in the valley of the chiefs. Travel the trail in the heat of the day Horses approaching, I thought I heard 
Five men appeared and they took us away. We were children of the long beak bird. Now, I'd like to return to the issue of man camps that you mentioned, Roxanne. These temporary housing encampments that are constructed often on indigenous territories. And these camps accommodate the influx of thousands of non-indigenous male workers following an oil boom. So I'm wondering, how do these camps and the toxic culture that surrounds them directly and indirectly impact local indigenous communities, businesses, women, children, the two-spirit people, and even indigenous men? And, and how might we shed light on the shadow that these predatory extractive economies, the fact that social and cultural effects of industrial camps are not included in environmental assessment reports or even considered in the planning for economic development? First, I just want to say thank you, sis, and you're so humble. <laughs> I just want to say she's so humble because, I mean, I see you like showing your son in a very powerful, beautiful way exactly what he's fighting for. My hands are up to you. I, I love the way you mother your children and, and how you do this work and how you live it in your life. So thank you. But about that, that question is like super um, complex. <laughs> I almost started crying right there. I've been really uh, emotional these days, but it's a good thing because, you know, this work is so complex and it's so, you know, and just thinking about like what Rachel said thinking about future generations and thinking about uh, where we're at and all the different front lines, but it's all one. Indigenous people, indigenous rights, environmental justice, all of this stuff, it's like we're all connected and everybody's doing um, intricate pieces. They're, put, they're doing what Creator called them to do. You know, just thinking about the reproduction and thinking about our salmon thinking about um, our, our orca, the black fish, and as far as, you know, the little critters that create, you know, the algae and all this other stuff, you know, we think about the, the world that's in the water, the water world, our trees and, and the air and, and the reproduction of, of all the life that was here before we were here. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because we weren't just put here to think of ourselves, you know, creator never created us to just be like, it's all about us as, as men and as, as people, but it's about being caretakers. It's about taking care of each other in all life, honoring all life. And so I wanted to say that because it's real moving. And when you think about it and, and then when people can connect to this movement like that, when people can do that, then they definitely, you know, will see what it is that we're fighting for and why we're standing on these front lines. So as far as how these man camps, what kind of dangers they, they impose on our communities, it's a huge danger because, first of all, okay, some of them are not right on the reservations from what I understand, but there are a lot that, that are very close within miles. I know that that the man camp that I was trafficked on is smack dab in the middle of my reservation where I grew up. Um, and now they have another one. So there's like two of them. There may be even three that I just don't see right now. So, and you think about it, like a lot of people think that a lot of us have a lot of money and, but we're, we're going through a lot of historical trauma. So when you look at that and you look at our communities, the perfect example is, is that there's, third world countries and somebody was saying the other day we're fourth world you know when you think about reservations these pipelines and these man camps what they do is they bring in a lot of money to a very impoverished marginalized community where there's already uh, a battle of um, major meth and drug and alcohol uh, issues historical trauma and so they move them on close to our areas where these men are like bringing in all this money, cashing out um, large amounts of checks, buying drugs. Um, you know, they are basically the buyers, right? They, they want the, the women. And 
And how does that affect our men? It affects the children of those women. It affects the husbands, the, the grandfathers, the grandpas, the dads, the sons. I mean, we're all connected. So like if one of our girls is, is trafficked there and ends up missing, that affects our entire community. It hurts us all across Indian country. Every one of these girls and every one of these men that go missing, it devastates us because we don't have the resources to find them. At this point, we're doing our best on a grassroots level, but like prevention is part of it and getting rid of these um, and, and being able to stop these man camps from coming into our communities. We don't want them around our, our tribes, around our reservations, around our people, on our land. And we should have every right to not have that there. But from what we know, we're going to constantly have to fight these people. And we need allies. We need a lot of people to help us do that. But it definitely puts us in danger. So I'd like to jump off the previous question and discuss the issue of legal jurisdiction and law enforcement that comes up around the crisis of MMIWG. And just to give our listeners a little background on this topic. Tribal officers have the authority to investigate and prosecute criminal and civil cases only if the suspected perpetrator is an enrolled member of a Native American tribe. Otherwise, the case belongs to the state, with one exception in the case of domestic violence. This legal precedent was set in the 1978 Supreme Court case Oliphant v. Suquamish, which stripped tribes of the right to arrest and prosecute non-Indians who commit crimes on indigenous territory. However, U.S. attorneys rarely pursue these cases. The Atlantic reported that in 2011, the U.S. Justice Department did not prosecute 65% of rape cases reported on reservations. So in the case of the Bakken boom, the tribe has little to no legal control over the thousands of non-native oil workers that doubled the reservation's population. And it seems that there are so many loopholes here, a kind of like jurisdictional void that systemically allows these cases to fall through the cracks and go underreported, unprosecuted, and unrepresented in the media. So Roxanne, I would really love for you to speak to this complex issue of jurisdiction and what kind of barriers do families face in seeking information and justice for their loved ones and family members? Well, it's heartbreaking. I will tell you that that is the center of my work is assisting and advocating and supporting families of missing indigenous people um, across the board. I, I would not turn down anybody, whether it's child, a, you know, two-spirit, transgender, male, female. I don't believe that this epidemic of missing and murdered uh, indigenous people touches all of us. But what I can tell you is that we're still faced with those issues. Today, um, I'm working with families that want the FBI to get involved and the FBI is not involved. And families are still being told, well, that's, we don't know what to do with that because that happened on the reservation. People on the reservation saying we don't have the, the resources. The FBI needs to get involved. It's still like that. We're still dealing with, with these type of hurdles right now and obstacles, as well as uh, I truly believe that, you know, like eventually things are going to get better. But for now, and it may be for another few years, and even then, what we know is even if we sign agreements, even if we uh, pass bills, if these bills all pass and become laws, we still know that grassroots people and um, social justice, uh, you know, advocates and, and and frontline people will still have to hold these governments and these policies accountable. Because if, if it were the case that things just happened the way they were supposed to, and, and the part I really don't get is why, why we need any laws for, the, for all law enforcement to treat indigenous women as human beings, indigenous people, indigenous children. Why do we have to do that? But that's the United States. That's the government that we're under right now who doesn't see Native people as human beings, who doesn't see Indigenous women as sacred, as valuable, our children as precious, precious, sacred gifts, you know? So that's where we're at. I mean, and, and it's really sad. So, 
yeah, we're just we're just trying to do our best. I mean, myself is is to call out these the FBI, the state attorneys, um, prosecutors, coroners, media, mainstream media. It's still very hard to get any kind of media, you know, to cover uh, families. If you Google down CNN and you go for missing, just just Google missing CNN, you can go down and you will see white person after white person that they are posting up for missing people. But they have only covered the story recently of um, Alyssa McLemore. And they did mention my cousin, Rosinda Strong. How did that happen? I have been able, because of the work that I've worked hard through my connections with a lot of like media around the world, I was able to ask everybody to help me get in contact with CNN for a little four-year-old girl out of Annis, Utah, who was missing for 21 days. And the family, it was just so heartbreaking and devastating. The entire tribe, the little village was out looking for her, including the president of their tribe. I was trying to get a hold of CNN so that they could go post it across the world about this little baby girl that was missing from this family that just was devastated by her disappearance. Unfortunately, the day that CNN got a hold of me, the family in a search found the little girl deceased. By not by luck, but by circumstances, I was able to establish a, a relationship and start talking with CNN and um, propose that they, I, I called them out and said, you guys have, don't cover our, our people when they go missing, especially our, you know, we have women and men going missing. And I, they I started asking me about some things and I told them about Alyssa and my cousin Rosinda here in Washington, one on the reservation, one in urban area here out of Kent, Washington. and so. They actually agreed to come, like, and they came fairly fast, like within three days, um, because we were having a vigil. But we just still got to continue to push. I mean, because like they say, and I don't know if you've heard it, but indigenous women don't just go, they go first missing with their families, you know, at their family table, at ceremony, in the homes of their families. But then they go missing to the community as far as like uh, mainstream media. And everywhere else, because nobody is, it's, we've been invisible. We've been invisible for far too long. We've been silenced for far too long. So that's the work that we're doing today is to uh, humanize and continuously push out the missing and murdered Indigenous people here in Canada and Alaska. And I, I just wanted to add to that, you yes, know, please. just that when we talk about, you know, these, these issues that we have with jurisdiction issues and things that this is just one other you know one of those obstacles that that we continue to run into as as native people you know and when we add it to the long list of tactics that have been used to commit genocide against you know to the attempted genocide against our people i mean it's you know it's another form of boarding schools adoption acts kill them kill the indian save the man forced sterilization you know, getting command of our resources and our lands. I mean, it's just, a, you know, as technology progresses and life progresses and we move forward in the society that we're in, it's just like, it's another, it's another one of those tactics that are used against our people, you know, to, to furthermore add to that attempted genocide that's still happening. That's the thing is all of these things are still happening. It's just now that doing this work and connecting with media, with people around the world, you know, people are finally hearing about these stories that are not new in our communities in any way, shape or form. So I, I think it's just another dynamic that's, you know, just been added to our list of, you know, things that they're doing to further get rid of Native people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and that's why I truly believe, uh, Rachel, I truly believe that we're at a point right now where unifying all these injustices on one level. I have changed the title of the work that I do. I used to, um, I had a banner that said Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Um, I gifted that to the Yakima Nation Tribal Council. And um, my amazing friends from 350 helped create me a new banner for Missing and Murdered Indigenous People. Yeah. And the reason why is because I've had my mother, my aunties, and other um, elder grandmas from my 
my reservation over in Yakima, tell me, hey, hey, Rocky, don't forget the men. And when the grandmas and older women, my elders, the ones that I respect and listen to, when the women are telling me to not forget, the grandmas are telling me not to forget the men. Yeah, that, that really connected and resonated with me. And so this is something that you can look at and you can say, what about our, our DACA people? What about the people on the borders? What about the genocide and the separation of families that is occurring there? Us as indigenous people to these lands right here, we actually have a privilege that they don't have, which normally we don't have a lot of privilege, right? It seems like, you know, there's a lot of more privileged people than us, but I don't know if that sounds right, but we have a privilege as native people to these territories here to advocate for our our border people, for our relatives that are also indigenous, that their families and their children are being basically genocide is being committed at those um, camps right now. And it's hurtful to watch and it's hurtful to hear all the things that are happening to these families and to these children. And and what about the men? I and mean, can you imagine? Like this is exactly what indigenous people went through. So for these men of these families to watch their children, you know, to be taken from them and the mother to be broken, the father to be broken. Um, all of this stuff that America is doing to these people is what they did to us. And the whole world is watching and nobody's doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yet America would step in for other refugees in other countries when it was convenient for them. They would step in and go in and help these refugees, bring them over to the United States. But yet Trump has such a problem with our borders along the coast of Mexico. Why? Why? because they're indigenous people and, and he's just a hateful man. I just, I don't have anything good to say about him. He's not a good person. He's not a decent person. And, and my heart breaks for those people mm -hmm. and what's happening to their families and what's happening to their territories over there too. The mm -hmm. indigenous people over there are suffering as well. This is my broke down place Everything's broken and wasting away Where I'm living is where I've chosen You'll learn to love it by the end of the day The moon and cicadas are my friends at night I walk down to the water when I don't feel right. This river flows places that I'll never see. And you'll learn to love it and you'll see what I mean. I might be lazy, made a half crazy, but there's no one around to see. Something's gone wrong, my mind's a bit hazy, but that's just me. You'd never know it if it weren't for this song. Now that I'm older and everyone's gone, you might think I don't get out much, but that's where you're wrong. Go down to the river. Make up a song And it gets me to where I need to be Gets me to where I need to be Oh, Roxanne and Rachel, I, I hear you and I think about not only are these issues not brought up in the mainstream media and hidden in so many ways, but they're also erased. And the history of colonization is erased from our textbooks, our narratives in the news. And it's horrific that this genocide and this destruction of indigenous people is still, it hasn't ended. And people need to know that because if people don't know that, then they're kind of living in this fantasy world um, that isn't real. It's not what's actually happening. And like going back to the jurisdiction issues, it, it seems like there is no quick fix here. But part of me is wondering, 
Well, I kind of have a two-part thought. There's one part of me that's wondering what legal amendments or changes could be made in tribal, state, or federal law enforcement and prosecution procedures. And then my second thought around that is, I know that one way that the indigenous rights and land sovereignty movement has been articulated is through the framework of free prior and informed consent, or FPIC. And this phrase comes from the 2007 UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and states that Indigenous people must grant their free prior and informed consent before an action is taken that impacts their land and rights. Now, as practiced, however, FPIC has not been honored and true consent has been violated by the state and corporate entities over and over again. So the second part is I'm wondering, how has the integrity of FPIC been hollowed out and in many cases replaced by a tribal consultation or really meaningless gestures that claim to fulfill their obligation of FPIC? <laughs> oh my goodness. We, Go did, ahead, a, Sam. Go we, ahead. <laughs> we did an entire tour on in Europe on just this specific issue. You know, I think FPIC it, it sounds great and, and it sounds like, you know, when people hear it, it gives them a good feeling of like, wow, they're talking to the people before they actually make decisions. And and you do hear people, you know, come and say, well, they talked to them. They, they did have that conversation because of FPIC. And, but, but the thing is, is it's another one of those, those things where um, I could have a friend who knows a friend that told another friend one thing. And then they'll, that one friend will come back and say, oh, yeah, well, I talked to that original source. But the really it is, it's like a, it's kind of that uh, telephone you know, chain thing where it, it's five people down the road and then they come back and say, oh yeah, well, we had a conversation. We see a lot of that work happening, even with the environmental stuff with like a lot of the large orgs, you know, we've had the opportunity to have discussions with and things, you know, asking, okay, well, are you developing relationships with communities? And they'll say, oh yeah, well, we talked to this one person who knew that organization and they said it was okay. And, and so that's a lot of what our government's doing is is they'll go and talk to one of their people, you know, that knows somebody else and, you know, uses that as consent, you know, free and informed prior consent. But the reality is, is, you know, Standing Rock, you know, and, and the Dakota Access Pipeline was a prime example of that, showing that those those conversations don't happen. Those agreements are not happening beforehand. And these oil companies, for example, have for so long been allowed to, to commit these, you know, these atrocities, but also get these projects funded because they've been able to buy their way through and ignore what indigenous people want and ignore the fact that, you know, that these sacred lands mean something to us, but nothing to them. I have to admit it was frustrating, you know, when the church had burned down the Notre Dame church over in France. And it's sad that that, you know, that that building, you know, burned and everything and it hold the, holds the history, you know, for people that it has. Well, the same thing is for our lands, you know, and, and to see people mourn and come together for a building, but not willing to come together for indigenous people who are violated on a regular basis. As much as I know that framework in the UN has good intentions. The sad part is, is just not actually being carried out. That free and fr prior informed consent, those conversations are not happening. And I've sat down with in bank board meetings firsthand, you know, and, and at the end of the day, they don't want to hear history. They don't want to hear genocide. They don't want to hear violence and desecration. They don't want to hear any of those. They want to hear that this is great for their economy, which means it's great for their pockets and that 1%. But free informant prior consent is, is not happening all over the world with Indigenous people. And until there's a standard put in place where they're being held accountable and fined for not doing these things or penalized for not doing these things, that's not going to change. But the great thing is that we get the opportunity to be on podcasts like this and to hold rallies and to do the work that we do and work with the organizations and media that we do to talk about these things. 
but also get other organizations that have been doing environmental work and finally connecting with indigenous people. Because at the end of the day, the teachings of indigenous people is really what's going to bring back the saving of our mother earth. Environmental groups are realizing that. And even, you know, scientists are realizing that those are the teachings and the things we have to go back to. So I think the conversation of free informed and prior consent has to keep happening, even if it's not, the intentions of it are not being met. My hope is that one day that they are, but it's so frustrating when you can sit with all of these banks and know Mm -hmm that they're not doing it because this many projects would not be happening and this many indigenous people would not be protecting their lands and standing on front lines and building, you know, blockades on their land to keep them from coming in. And and so we know that this work isn't happening, but we have to keep talking about it and we have to keep moving it forward. And at some point that work needs that framework of free informed and prior consent has to start happening or, we're always going to be fighting and we're always going to be doing this. And so that's mm-hmm. what I think about free and for prior consent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's such a mind work because on one hand, like we were speaking earlier, there's hardly any power to prosecute or enforce issues that are happening on tribal lands. And then at the same time, there's this kind of illusion of the consent that's supposed to happen before the fact but on on both ends of the spectrum basically you're being drained of power and Mm -hmm. that is it's horrendous it's a horrendous that this country allows that to happen but i really think it makes it worse when you can put a label on something and say see look at the banks are doing this and look at we talked to this person and it's all okay Um, Because then it allows people to walk away from the situation going, oh, well, that's handled. We don't need to worry about that because they've done the FPIC um, with this project. So it's it's really a mind warp. And I appreciate you both speaking to that. And also, Rachel, how Mazoska Talks is using the FPIC to fight for um, just banking practices. And it's just so it's so deep. And I wanted to also talk a little bit more about Mazaska Talks. Later this month, I'll actually be speaking with Ruth Breach from Rainforest Action Network and Tara Hauska from Honor the Earth, specifically about uh, the banking on climate change report and divestment. But Rachel, I'd also love to hear from you about Mazaska Talks divestment strategy. Now your website reads, quote, corporations and banks will not move on from fossil fuel era because of our compelling moral and ecological arguments about why they should. So we are learning to speak their language, money talks, end quotes. So I'm wondering what potential impact can the divestment movement have on the fossil fuel industry? Because while there have been really large strides, oil companies and banks are still making such high profits with, I think, $100 trillion plus global capital market. So while Mazaska Talks divestment campaign is more targeted and focused, I wonder what it would take for divestment to be a viable solution, or at least part of uh, the solution, towards disarming these incredibly monstrous and powerful extractive industries. And what do you say to skeptics who argue that divestment is just a misguided tactic or simply a gesture, uh, you know, a, a political gesture? I think with Mazda Scott Talks and everything that it's given us leverage because it's also given us the opportunity to look for solutions. Besides, we've we've kind of been in this place in, in society where we have counted on, you know, Wall Street banking. And I think with divestment, I think it sounds like, you know, for a lot of people, it, it is not necessarily something that will work. But the reality is, is that it has empowered, you know, people, everyday people, like we said, talking to someone about, you know, the morals and values that your bank shares, and then making a decision to pull your money out. That's being an activist right there. That's making a stand. But what Mazda Scott Talks is is also doing is, is not just talking about removing our money, but also what are the solutions to that? So it's given us the chance to talk about public banking, you know, and, and putting money back in the hands of our communities and the people making decisions. And uh, we're in the middle right now of advocating, you know, the city of Seattle to, you know, move in that direction. Um, With 
the reports and everything that have come out and everything, yeah, these these corporations are spending tons of money on you know the fossil fuel industry and these projects. But at the same time, we may not see the end results of this in our lifetime, and I guarantee that we won't. But it doesn't mean that we don't stop doing the work that is being done by Rainforest Action Network and people such as Ruth Breach and Tara Hauschka and how banks um, do have buying power, but in numbers, it's just like that movie Ants, you know, the part where all of the grasshoppers are talking about taking over and they basically say that, mm-hmm, sense mm-hmm. Of, you know, hey, uh, if they figure out you know, that that them coming together is going to overrun us, then we're screwed, you know, because there's more of them than there is of us. And the reality is, is that there's more of us struggling and living as a result of the crappy decisions that these banks and institutions are making. There's more of us than there is the ones that are gaining from it. And so I think it's just going to take time and leverage for people to communicate that. But I think also the reason Mazda Scott Talks is such a big push in this also is because it is an indigenous led organization and it keeps our voice out there and it keeps our situation relevant and it keeps it in the forefront and it keeps us being able to talk about it and to show people. So I think these reports that come out are important. I think all of this work is important because even if we don't see the end result of it and the end of fossil fuel usage and the end of these funders um, from these banks, we still have to keep doing the work that moves in. So we have to keep talking about divestment. And divestment is important because like I said before, at this point, over $40 billion has been removed from these banks. And while that may not seem like a lot of money in the contrast of the trillions and trillions of dollars that get deposited into these Wall Street banks. It is a huge change. It is a huge um, chunk of money that they're losing because now they are lobbying to, you know, um, look at these new laws that they're trying to put in place about punishing pipeline protesters in all of these states and all of the, the laws that are coming into place that if you do speak out and and rally. We're very much moving in that dictator kind of state, but at the same time, we have a voice more than we ever have. And I think we have to keep using it because they would not be doing this damage work if something we were doing was not working. And so people are reading these reports. They are seeing banks are contributing to climate change and in the in the collapse of our environment and all of these things and so so I think I think Mazda Scott talks in terms of a, of an indigenous sense has been able to really bring the indigenous world together with I guess those other environmentalists and, and groups that are doing this same work and I think if we all come together we will start seeing those changes and we may not see them right now but that doesn't mean that we can't give up that hope of actually stopping funding of fossil fuels and and coming together you know like in that cartoon and realizing the power that we have in numbers and that's that work of of our people coming together all people coming together and this not just being an indigenous issue or just a black and people of color issue that it is a worldly issue and we all have to come together to start fighting this or none of us are going to have anything those most impacted by these systems of oppression and and really all of us are not meant to understand the inner workings of the fossil fuel industry or big banking or jurisdictional technicalities or legal agreements and amendments, you know, by design, of course. So I just want to name that reclaiming this information is such a powerful act in in and of itself. And I want to thank you both so much for taking the time to be in conversation with me today and for giving all of us who are listening the tools and knowledge to hold accountable not only the web of complicit governmental bodies and corporate powers, but also ourselves. And before we close, I'd really love to invite you both to share anything that might be on your heart and mind at this time. And, you know, Roxanne, if you also want to speak to um, the last question of holding spaces or rituals or ceremonies um, in order to to do this healing work as well. I, I loved everything Rachel was saying. I think, uh, you know, as far as like um, in doing this work, ritual healing ceremonies, I think getting back to culture, like uh, re- restoration of our culture and our languages and um, our indigenous foods and our ceremonies and our language, you know, so when we take all those things 
and we live that life because see, that's who we were. That's who we are. That's who we are. That's what's in our DNA. That's what's in the, the memories of our, um, what creates who we are. And I know that for me, every, every time I hear a drum, every time that I'm, I'm looking around and I see my natives, uh, whether it be my family, I could be somewhere with Rachel, I could be at drum, you know, um, we could be going to sweat. It, it's where I'm the most happiest and the most complete and the most whole. And when we're doing those things and we're honoring who we really are and who creator made us to be, those things are so healing. And to also, you know, deny and, and, and turn your backs on, um, turn your backs on, like, like as indigenous people, like um, we have been up against alcoholism and drug addiction and all of these things that lead into so much more trauma and stuff for our communities. So, you know, I always say like a sober native is a dangerous native, you know, a sober Indian is a dangerous Indian. It's like the things that I'm doing today, I couldn't do before I got clean and sober. So I'm coming up on five years clean and sober. So empower yourselves, um, invest in yourselves, love yourselves, come back to that place. Because if we don't love ourselves and we don't have that relationship that Rachel was talking about with Creator, Um, then we can't start the healing. And this journey is individual. So Mm -hmm. we can heal as a nation together. But until we, until I got clean and sober, until I, I was willing to, to take this path to work on Roxanne, face Roxanne, face my fears, face my failures, face, you know, um, and be willing to do some things differently. I couldn't have done any of this. So like that's for each person. I don't know what that looks like for you, but but you don't even have to have a drug or a drink or have that type of addiction to be suffering, to be suffering in silence. So it's a lot of healing and as a people as a whole, and I'm, I'm predominantly speaking to indigenous people, but as far as the healing and rec- reconciliation and things like that from non-native, from the, from the government that started out of white supremacy, and, it, and I truly believe it's still very uh, white supremacist and and uh white led this government is still led off of uh the genocide of indigenous people and the marginalization of of poor people and and people of color so when i think about that like the reconciliation and the ceremony that needs to happen is that the government needs to acknowledge like they have never acknowledged the holocaust on indigenous people here they have never they they've acknowledged. I mean, they even they even acknowledge the 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 Holocaust of the Jewish people over here. They have acknowledged the the slavery and the um the genocide. Not maybe in that form, but it's talked about in history. It's talked about in the schools. But the United States has not acknowledged the 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 Holocaust of of Indigenous people, of our people, and and it's not being taught in the schools. It's not being told. Um, the truth is not being told. So until things like this happen, it, it's not even so much about treaties being honored as much as it is about just there being an honor and truth, you know, and, and, and a respect for us as the first people who Rachel makes good points on. Um, she has numbers about about how many indigenous people is it, it Rachel's at four percent nationally. Or no, four percent here in the United States, right? No, it's and then four percent, two percent. Yeah, it's under one percent in the United States, and it's four percent in the world. So that's what we make up. So when you think about that number, and you think about like like all of our people, all of our ancestors that were murdered, and and the the genocide, the Holocaust on us, you know, and 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 people want to tell us, get over it, get over it. You know, it was in the past. It, it's still happening. Genocide is still here. It's, it, it's systemically. It's, it's environmentally. It's, it's on our people. So, yeah, it, it makes me angry. Makes me angry. And, and I'm not the person, like, and I, and I probably say things the way I do, but, but it's just really hurtful, I guess. That's all I want to say is that we need that. We need that. We need people to to uh, stand with us and, and we're grateful. I, I'm grateful for, for all the non-natives, all the allies that are more than just allies, but co-conspirators. 
that stand with us and invest in our work and, and, and in our communities, those are, those are the great people right there. Thank you so much, Roxanne. That really, really hit me in a place. And I'm sure for those listening, it will, it'll move them. And Rachel, if there, there's anything else you wanted to mention as your last thoughts, um, I want to open up the floor to you as well before we close this really meaningful, important, very deep conversation. Um, I just want to say, you know, again, thank you for giving us the space to have this conversation today. I, I think that's been one of our greatest, you know, achievements recent in the recent years is like having platforms to have these talks and having some visibility. I think that's, I mean, that's another whole conversation we can talk about is, you know, the invisibility of indigenous people and in, in so in all areas. And so I'm, I'm thankful to you and, and for the wild podcast for having us on here to talk about these. And what I really, you know, just want to say is that this work is not because we want to be doing this. We're doing this because we have to do this work. We have to keep fighting for our future generations. We have to keep fighting for visibility. We have to keep fighting for equality all I can say to people is like, get involved. And it doesn't have to necessarily be with what I'm supporting or what Roxanne is supporting or, you know, what everybody else is supporting, but get involved in something, you know, we're, we're at a place right now where there's so much going on in the world, whether it's our, our government, it's environmental, it's, it's human rights, it's indigenous rights, it's everything, but we have to start finding a place, you know, that, that, that touches our heart and, and, we have to start doing what's good for people because there's so much that's going bad for people. And, and just, I mean, I would just tell people, you know, find what connects you, you know, find what brings you peace and, you know, protecting our people and, you know, letting people know that we're here and fighting for our mother earth and, and, and understanding that relationship that we have with her as indigenous people. That's what's important to me. That's what brings me peace. And that's why I'll keep talking about this and keep bringing it up and keep, you know, tying divestment and all of our strategies and missing and murdered indigenous women to every single platform that we possibly can, because these are really the only opportunities that we have right now until our voices are heard. And so I'm just thankful again for this opportunity. I'm always, always honored to share space with my sis Roxanne and, and to hear about the work that she does, but also how we can support that work. and. And so, yeah, so I think, you know, if we could tell anybody is like, you know, find your healing, you know, find what connects you. And, you know, for me, my native people, you know, connects me and that's what brings me peace. And that also is my guiding light and, you know, in raising my children and, and them knowing who they are and them not living that erasure. So, yeah, so I, I think us having this talk today has been great and I hope, you know, everybody that's listening, you know, finds something from it that touches them and that they can, you know, do something with. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, lastly, I'd thank like you, to... Thank you, Yeah. Thank uh, you. And lastly, I'd like to read an excerpt from a poem by Gregory Schofield from his anthology, Witness I Am, and then invite our listeners at home or wherever you may be to take a moment of silence as we send our collective love and prayers for the safe return of indigenous people who are missing at this time. So this is the poem. Ooh. She is splitting a mouthful of stars. She is holding the light more than those who despised her. She is folding clouds in her movement. She is new to this sound. She is unbroken flesh. She is splitting a mouthful of stars. She is laughing more than those who shamed her. She is ten horses breaking open the day. She is new to these bones. She is holy in their dust. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah, that was beautiful. Thank you. Well, thank you both. And uh, can I, I say some names real quick? Please. I want to say um, my cousin Rosinda has been missing since October 2nd of 2018 from the Yakima Indian Reservation. Uh, 
Alyssa McLemore has been missing since 2009 from Kent, Washington. And Leona Kinsey has been missing since 1999 from Oregon. And presently, uh, out of Fort Hall, um, Austin Peeble, Austin Frost Peeble has been missing since February 3rd of 2018. Matthew J. Bronco has been missing from Fort Hall since April of 2019. You know, like I said earlier, there's there's more than that. I could say so many names. I have list upon list of, of families. Those are the, the people that I'm working with right now. Esther Smith has been missing since 2009 as well, or 2016. No, no, I think it was 2009, right out of Everett, Washington. It's just, you know, it's heartbreaking. So I wanted to say those names because those those names, it's important to use this these moments like this, like what, what Rachel was saying, but to also use these moments to to put these names out. You can hashtag these names and you'll find the, the flyers of these people or you can go to Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives, No Borders, and you can look them up there. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. That felt really important to name them in this conversation. The Erasure of Missing and Murdered Indigenous People, MMIWG, and this crisis at large is connected to the negligent lack of reporting, awareness, and access to information and resources. We urge you to take action this week and support the important work of frontline communities and grassroots organizers in the following ways. First, there are currently three pieces of legislation moving through the courts that would help address important gaps in data collection, reporting, and visibility. Savannah's Act, the Not Invisible Act, and the Reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act through a bill that incorporates tribal provisions. Call and write to your members of Congress and urge them to take action and support these bills. Second, to learn how you can divest your personal, institution, or community funds, please visit mazoskatalks.org. Third, please follow Roxanne White's campaign, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives No Borders, on Facebook and share within your networks. Fourth, sign the Statement of Opposition Against Enbridge's proposed Line 3 oil pipeline and or send your support directly to the front lines of resistance with a donation at stoplinethree.org. And lastly, please share this episode with your friends and family, spread the word within your larger networks and demand greater coverage of MMIWG issues. For links and more information, you can visit our website or click on the details tab of this episode. Thank you for listening to another episode of For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayana Young. The music you heard today was from Carrie Morin and Justin Cromer. I'd like to thank our fabulous team, podcast production and editing Andrew Stores, writing and lead research Hannah Wilton, outreach and research Francesca Glassbell and Aidan McRae, podcast music Carter Lou McElroy, digital community organizing Aaron Wise, Graphic and web design, Erica Ekram, and Melanie Younger with Partnerships in Media.